So in 2040, you're predicting that we will get the vapor canopy back, the biblical firmament. Yes. There will be waters above and waters below, right? Sort of. Yes. yes. Uh, how quickly do you see that happening after after the uh, after the Phoenix passes? Um. Uh. I'm going to give you the scenario and I'm going to let you answer that for yourself because I, I I don't think I'm educated enough to know that answer. I just know how a vapor canopy is formed. So two times since the collapse of the vapor canopy, the vapor canopy almost came back. Each time was for 24 to 26 years in the, in the historical record. And I've documented these and what happened at those times. Now, to form a vapor canopy, all it takes is two things. One of them is that volcanism Actual volcanoes have to outgas and and basically sh shove ash and pumice into the atmosphere all over the, all over the world. Multiple volcanoes are needed to do this simultaneously, but it only takes a couple couple months. This is what's needed. But at the exact same time that the lower mesosphere is filling up with ash and pumice from the outside of the atmosphere, red fine dust from Phoenix layers the entire mesosphere, gets stuck in those water vapor droplets high up in the atmosphere called the mesosphere. With that type of layering from the Phoenix of the red dust phenomenon at the exact same time that the volcanic ash is on the bottom part of the mesosphere, I don't know how long it'll take, but I don't think it's but a matter of maybe six six weeks to maybe two months to for the vapor canopy to come full effect. Once the vapor canopy becomes the dark purple light returns, uh, all all the whole the whole new biosphere is introduced. Yeah, I actually reached out to the uh, scientists at the um, in Glen Rose, Texas, trying to see if they were going to ever make available their their uh, plans uh, that they use to build their hyperbaric biosphere, and uh, never heard back from them. But that absolutely fascinates me. There's a lot of. Uh, because it's really fascinating to me. I know you said that you feel like the DNA is kind of locked down uh, at a certain point past a a adolescence, and there's there's truth to that. But we also see DNA being unlocked and all kinds of miraculous healings happening. And the fact that two of the scientists at Mount Pele grew two inches and they were like in their fifties or something crazy like that suggests that their their DNA wasn't very locked down and that people, you know, adults and even older adults may experience fairly significant changes under a real, a real full-fledged vapor canopy. Yeah, and so the ambient radiation did it, did it it did something. Just like I showed pictures of that of the hyperbaric uh, um little containment deal that they made. Yep. In Glenroll, I showed pictures in one of my videos of that. They grew uh, like small, like tadpoles, frogs, uh, fruit flies, beetles. They grew them to three times their normal size, and they lived three times longer. And this was just in that small little chamber that they made. So you can imagine uh, an increase in atmospheric pressure. You can imagine the removal of the UV UV light and replaced with with more beneficial uh, uh, radiation. Uh, coming through the coming through the vapor canopy, you can imagine the um, uh, basically the the interaction between the flora the flora and the atmosphere now because thing plants are going to be growing to astonishing sizes. It's already been shown that, that plants grow fantastic under dark lights. They don't need they don't need the sun's light, but. Uh, Plus, yeah. also, the nutrient density and that kind of food and the animals and everything is going to go through the roof, you know. Uh, so yep. there's going to be a lot of changes at all levels. You know, you're, going to, you're talking about different types of microbiomes and, you know, yeast cultures and everything that would be, uh, uh, you know, interacting with a new biology like that. I mean, I've, I've theorized this kind of thing for a long time. So, so I want to uh, add something to that real quick. Yeah. So there are even prophecies that said, like, Oh, uh, <clears throat> let him that is evil be evil still. Let him that is good be be good still. And that during the apocalypse, people people just won't be able to die. They will will themselves to die. They will pray to the mountains and the rocks to fall on them. But uh, uh, the events of the apocalypse, which would normally bring about fatalities, aren't doing that. They're bringing about suffering. So the passages that we get uh, in eschatology about like like him him that be evil, evil let him be evil still and good be good. We we have this picture of. 
two different types of survivors of the apocalypse. One are those who are like the meek of the earth. They inherit the earth. They, they don't feel nothing. They don't go through none of the bad stuff in the apocalypse. They're observers. Then there is another group that feel every bit of it. They're victim to every bit of it, but they don't die from it. And this, this too is indicative of the vapor canopy ecology, which, which we know of that from the traditional record, the vapor cut people grew to astonishing sizes. Their cuts were healed almost instantly. They could hold their breath for long periods of time. And we know that's factual unless they had submarines in the past because with there, there are special types of mollusks that only that only found found on seabeds like at 170 to 100 to, uh, to 220 feet of depth. Humans can't swim that that, that low. But we found entire mollusk beds where the mollusks, mollusks have been formed where ancient humans were doing just that they were going to the depths of the sea and pulling up pulling up all these things and bringing them up and we know we, you can't do that today so therefore under a different atmospheric pressure which would also change the pressure of the water and the ability to take a single breath and hold your breath for seven seven to 15 minutes this would be this would be possible in a world where <clears throat> i mean you're not breathing 12% oxygen, you're breathing 92% oxygen. So it does something totally different to you when you when you take a breathing exercise for 10 seconds and then one big breath and you dive into the water and you don't even have to resurface for five, six, seven, nine, 12 minutes. Yeah, that's just really, really wild. There's a guy um, named George Weissman who has uh, experimented with something called Brown's gas. And it's a hydrogen-based protocol, but he created a thing called an aqua cure that will heal scars and all of these things that, that make it sounds like it has some resonance with the atmosphere under the vapor canopy. And I we got a machine and I've been using it. And you can breathe, breathe in the uh, the gas. You can also drink it if it's bubbled through water. And I went from being able to, you know, do like maybe a hundred push-ups to where I'm I'm pushing 200 push-ups now. Just straight up, just boom. Can do, you know, just it, it, it's got to be this machine. It's got to be the, uh, taking in this this uh, different type of atmosphere into my body. So it's absolutely fascinating.